Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Bethany Church. Let's go ahead and stand up and get ready to worship and sing together. Let's pray as we open up. Father, we thank you for this time to come back together to gather again. Lord, we ask that as we worship this morning, our hearts would be unified in praising Jesus and lifting him up. God, we ask that you would be risen above every one of our circumstances and our hearts and minds, Lord, that we would exalt you above any problems or troubles that we're facing. We ask, Lord, that we could fill our hearts with joy today. In Jesus' name, amen.
of our God and King. Lift up your voice to Him and sing. Oh, praise Him. Oh, praise Him. Let all things their Creator bless. And worship Him in humbleness. Who you are, you are 
everything sufficient in yourself, Lord, and yet so involved in our lives. God, we thank you that when we don't see it, you're working. When we don't feel it, you're moving. God, that we can have faith that you are moving at the sound of our prayers. That you care for us, Lord. You care for every hair on our head. Lord, we ask that we would fix our eyes on you, Lord, that it would lift us above the circumstance, God. That we would remember that we are fulfilled and satisfied and joyful in you today. So God, we pray that you would be magnified in this place, Jesus. That you'd be lifted high as we preach the word, as we hear a message to the kids, Lord, and as we unify together in what we do this morning, that you'd be lifted up in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated.
Well, good morning, good morning. It's so good to see you guys again here today. I'm glad for so many of you families that were able to come out today. Again, we love you and greet everyone that's at home uh, watching online. You are here with us in spirit, so it's good to be back. My name is Miss Laura, and I'm going to do the kids' lesson again today. So we have been in the book of Psalms for a while. If you've been in sword training, you know that like Miss Laura loves the book of Psalms. But we're the church for Sunday mornings. That has been our topic, and that's been the book that we've done. So hopefully some of our sword trainers, all of us from zero to 99, carry our swords with us to church, either on our phone or um, in a paper form. So here's Miss Laura's sword, right? And if you break my sword in half, and that's possibly not the best way to articulate it, but if you like open your sword in half, you're going to find yourself in the book of Psalms, generally speaking. And remember that Psalms is spelled with a P. How silly. Don't you feel like Psalms should be spelled with an S? Anyway, so look for the one that is P-S, and that will get you there. And leave yourselves there in that, in that part of your sword, because today, Pastor Matt is just going to have us in the Psalms quite a bit today. So the Psalms are, it's another word for song. There's 150, everyone say 150. There's 150 songs. And you know what's amazing about the Psalms is they don't all sound alike. They're Psalms that are like praise and worship. And then, so they're like, Lord, you're great. I'll, you'll never fail me. I'm happy to be in your presence. And then there's other Psalms that are called Psalms of Lament, which was so timely here in Minneapolis as we have lamented as a nation, as we have lamented for our city, those psalms almost sound sad, where we're saying, God, where are you? Are you coming? Will you, will you heal me? Will you heal my city? And then there's another types of psalm, and that's what Pastor Matt's going to talk on today, and those are called the imprecatory psalms. But those are the ones where you see the psalmist say, God, will you defend me? And have you ever noticed when you hear songs on the radio, you hear all those types of songs on the radio? Some better, some worse. But you hear all that those different themes kind of come out. Some songs are just like, God, I sing to you and I worship you. And your heart just kind of comes alive. And if you're Miss Laura, the heart shakes and your arms go out the window and you're singing. And then there's other ones where I'm like, this is, I'm feeling sad today. And this song is doing that. Well, beloved, that is because that's how our songs are written. Our songs in the Bible, you will find all those different types. So today we're going to talk about the song, the psalms, where you say, God, I have enemies, and I need you to defend me. So those are the ones where you're asking God to defend you from your enemies. So in your sword today, we're going to go through three simple slides where God says what to do to either the Israelites or just uh, his followers when you have an enemy. Now, this is very interesting. If I had a physical enemy, I can guarantee you I would probably want my version of a sword, America's current version of a sword, or America's current version of a shield. If I had somebody banging on my door that wanted to legitimately hurt me, as the Israelites did, I probably would want something similar to this. But there's a story in Exodus 14, Delaney's putting it up on the screen right now, where the Israelites were not safe, and they had left Egypt, and they're walking, and remember, they're walking to the Red Sea, and God is getting ready to part the Red Sea, because right behind them, so the Israelites are walking, 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 they're escaping Egypt, but the Egyptians are right behind them. And beloved, bear in mind, it says that the Egyptians brought all their chariots, all their horses, all their armory with them, and they're coming up to the Israelites, and the Israelites are afraid, and they call out to the Lord, as they say, Lord, what should we do? And God speaks through Moses, and he says this, this is ridiculous. When you feel the enemy coming on you, turn around and use all your jiu-jitsu and fight the Israelites back. hi -ya. Does God say that to them? No, look at what he says. He says, the Lord will fight for you. You have only to say it together. Be still. Oh, oops. The other version says be still. <laughs> be silent. There's another version that says be still or be silent. The Lord will fight for you. And you just need to be silent. Well, that's an odd way to fight against your enemies. So let's go on to the next place. Another place in the psalm, it, God spells that out crystal clear. It's another place where the uh, psalmist feels like they're under attack, and it's probably a legit attack. This isn't probably just in their head. And the psalmist says, be still and know that I am God. Psalm 4610. Read that with me. Say, be still and know that I am God. Wait, 
We have two examples in scripture where there's a legitimate enemy pursuing a child of God, and God says, here's what I want you to do. I'm going to give you the battle plan. Ready? Don't do anything. Be still and know that I'm God. Third example, this one is like, you're, you're going to be saying, Miss Laura, can you talk about any other psalm ever? It's from the 23rd Psalm, shocker of all shockers. I try to tie that in almost all the time. And this one, we get the picture that not only are we to, to, to practice stillness, it says, he prepares a table in the presence of your enemies. Of your who? Of your enemies. There's a legitimate enemy against the Israelites here, but against all of us. And God says, here's what I want you to do, battle plan. When the presence of your enemies are at your back, I want you to practice stillness. And in this place it says, I'm going to prepare a table before you in the presence. And the implication is, sit down. Sit down. Don't pick up your sword. Don't pick up your shield. I just want you to sit down. Beloved, why would God call for such stillness such seemingly nothingness when there are real enemies. The real enemies in scripture were the Egyptians, but we know that we do not wage war against flesh and blood. There is a real enemy after our soul. There's somebody that really wants to hurt us, the enemy. And God says, be still. You want to know why? Because he will fight for you. He invites you to be still so that the defender of your soul will say, I my name will be great, and I will fight your battles. And that stillness, you get to watch the Lord deliver you on that day. Beloved, remember, these Israelites, it was a real army, right? And God says, I will even fight those battles for you. Beloved, practice stillness. And it says in that 4610, Psalm 4610, it says, be still and do what? It gives us something to do. And know, I am God. So today, while Pastor Matt's preaching, I want your swords open because he's going to take us through Psalms. And when, we, when it says, be still and know that I'm God, I think it's an opportunity for us to know who God is. So as he has us in the Psalms, I want you to be following through in the Psalms. And I want you to learn alongside Miss Laura, who does God say he is in the Psalms? If you say this, I'm going to listen to you and I'm going to believe you. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for this morning. I ask that you would speak to us that you are our defender and you invite us into stillness to remember that you are a defender. Pray that you would bless us this morning and make us courageous in who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, hello, Bethany Church. My name is Jacob Ariano. For some of you who do know me, you've gotten a chance to know a little bit about my life and a little bit about my experience in ministry and about my experience in missions, and especially my time throughout Bethany being a student and a member of your church. For those of you who don't know me, um, I'm from Southern California, and um, in January of 2019, I decided to become a student, and I became engaged in intercultural studies and Bible theology majors to further my education, further my training in the missions field that I haven't learned already be, um, being involved in short-term missions. What I'm currently involved in is I'm currently involved in a campaign to spend 16 months in Turkey as the part of the Bethany Global University program for four years. You spend your third year and half of your fourth year overseas. I myself will be uh, the first team going overseas to Ankara, Turkey. A little bit about what Turkey is, Ankara is the current capital city of Turkey, um, but it's actually only been the capital city for just over 100 years. Before that, it, is, it was what is now Istanbul, but formerly known as Constantinople. Ankara has a population of about 6 million people. And that includes people of um, multiple age groups, from young age child all the way to elderly adults. It also holds all the government officials of the 81 provinces surrounding Turkey. Uh, part of what I will be involved in with a team of four, um, one other guy and two girls from the BGU program, or Bethany Global University, 
is we'll be involved in a number of possible ministries. One of them is actually supported by a Christian church of about 500 believers coming from Muslim ethnic backgrounds inside Ankara. This, ha this takes part in two different ways, and it mainly includes prayer walking. One way is walking around the 494 different neighborhoods inside Ankara, or traveling around to some of the outer provinces around Turkey. Mainly this consists of either walking the perimeter of the neighborhood or the city, wandering through the neighborhood or, um, or city, and uh, praying over that area, praying over your time, praying over the people, and um, praying for opportunities to meet new people. The main idea of global internship, for those of you who may not know, is to reach out um, and form relationships. This is one of the best ways that Bethany has to offer about becoming a missionary, more of a hands-on way of learning to become a missionary in an area that you have never been to and don't speak the language. Another um, couple I, uh, opportunities that we do have, uh, one is working with Syrian refugees in a refugee camp just outside of Ankara. And another is working with university students coming from different countries, whether from Europe to the West or from the Middle East just off to the east of Turkey. And this is mainly a ministry of TEFL, or teaching English as a foreign language to these students. What I'm currently looking for is, I, is two different ways of support. One is financial support, and another is, of course, prayer support, as I continue in my campaign until August 1st of this year. And as I go through with this and further my experience in missions, for finances, I have a, a budget of a little over 32 grand to raise. Right now, currently, I'm at 61%, and I have about two months left to raise these funds. Uh, for those of you who would like to, if you haven't already, to join me on this opportunity, or if you are interested to hear a little bit more about this, you can contact me at my email address. That is jacobariano at gmail.com. Ariano is spelled A-R-I-A-N-O. Or feel free to call me. My number is 951-642-0004. If you'd just like to simply talk or if you'd like to enter in on this ministry with me, whether financially or through prayer, I'd be more than happy to hear from you. I look forward to communicating with you further. Thank you and have a great Sunday. Well, good morning. That's great. It's always awesome to see uh, someone who is answering the call that God has put on their life uh, to, to serve God, whether here or overseas. Let's just take a minute and let's just pray for Jake uh, during these last two months of, of fundraising. Lord, we just thank you so much for Jake, his, his service here at the church. Lord, he was always the, the first one to show up, uh, involved in helping us set up and prepare for children's ministry and and getting the sanctuary ready, Lord, he has such a servant's heart. We just pray for him during this time, Lord, that you bring uh, partners beside him, Lord, that can't go themselves but want to see your name made great in Turkey, Father. And so bring those people next to him, support him with the funds, Lord, be with him during this time of preparation, Father. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, good morning. I am one of the Pastor Matts. Coming up here in a minute, you'll have another Pastor Matt because we like to make it as confusing as possible for you guys. So we welcome you, whether you're here, whether you're joining us at home. We are just really glad that you are with us this morning. If you're visiting, I invite you guys to go to Bethanychurch. I'm sorry, Bethanychurchmn.com and then click on the Connect tab. If you do that, there'll be a form for you to fill out. You can put your info. There's also a place for you to put prayer requests. And we love to pray for you. We love to reach out. So that's just a great way to connect with us. So we invite you to do that. And if you would like to give this morning, you have two options. You can either uh, drop your check or your envelope off in the box on your way out. Or you can just go to bethanychurchmn.com give. And there are multiple options uh, for you to be able to 
uh, give your tithe there this morning. So we invite you to do one of those if you had planned on giving this morning. And again, as we are still kind of in this crazy time, we are, this is the second week that we've opened our doors. If you would like to come and join us, you are welcome to do that. If you want to stay home and, and watch it from home with your family, you're welcome to do that. If you want to get together with your small group, you're welcome to do that. Whatever makes you feel comfortable, we just want you to join us one way or another. And so however you would like to tune in and worship with us on Sunday morning, we invite you to do that. Coming up July 12th, we are going to have our outdoor service. And so we're really excited about gathering together, enjoying summer. Summer is a huge deal here in Minnesota because it only lasts like three weeks. And so we want to take advantage of it as much as possible. And so July 12th, we're going to do our outdoor service. And I'm really excited. We're working on providing some really good food for you. You guys know I'm from the South, and Jesus and food go together. And so we are really working on coming up with a good way to feed you guys, hang out, worship the Lord together, and just celebrate being a church outside. And so mark your calendars for July 12th. If you are not able to make it, or you're still not comfortable navigating out, we're working on a way to stream that. It'll probably be on Facebook Live. So we're coming up with an option to be able to bring it uh, to your home also if you are not able to join us on July 12th. Uh, coming up next week, we're going to be launching our new summer series, Summer Road Trip. It's navigating, uh, the light, navigating our journey in life. And so I'm really excited. We're going to be talking about some fun topics. Next week we are opening uh, with, I'll pull this car over, shutting your mouth. And so I'm sure that many of you have been in those situations where your kids just won't stop fighting behind you, right? He kicked me. No, she hit me. No, he pulled my hair. And they go back and they go forth. And you're just like, I'll pull this car over. Shut your mouth, right? And we can all learn from those situations, especially now. Many of us need to learn to shut our mouths. And so next week, we're going to launch Summer Road Trip. Uh, but this week, we're going to conclude our series on praying the Psalms with the other Pastor Matt. And so at this time, I'd like to invite Pastor Matt to come up and deliver the word. Am I on here? All right, there we go. Good morning. It's good to see everyone here. So as has been mentioned, we are wrapping up our series on the Psalms, on, on this uh, prayer book that God has given us. God has given us a book to teach us how to pray, to help us to pray, help us how to praise, help us how to lament. I'm going to move this up a little. Um, help us how to pray, how to praise, how to lament, how to trust. And... Uh, Interesting, it seems, it seems to a lot of us something, God put something strange in our, in our prayer books. Uh, at least it feels strange to a lot of us. It, it's obviously not strange to God, but that's what we're going to talk about this morning. Uh, the imprecatory psalms, and that's kind of a, a fancy way of saying the psalms that call down a curse on your enemies or call down judgment on your enemies. And, and that feels really weird to us when we encounter them. Why did God put this in my prayer book? What is this doing here? What do I do with it? Am I supposed to pray this way? This feels weird. So that's what we're going to be talking about this morning. Um, just a, a little disclaimer. I, I'm aware we have uh, children here this morning. Uh, some of the verses are relatively graphic that we're going to be looking at. Uh, I'm not going to dwell on them un unnecessarily. Just giving you a heads up, though. But I know a lot of these kids uh, are reading the Bibles for themselves anyway, and so they're going to kind of come across them at some point probably, and uh, there might be some hard questions, but uh, it's in God's Word, and you can send them to me afterwards if you want. But let's just go ahead, and uh, I'm going to read from three different uh, imprecatory psalms, uh, three that are kind of considered uh, the most intense of these types of psalms. Uh, so I'm going to read a little from Psalm 58, Psalm 109, and Psalm 137. 
I'm just going to pray before we start, though. Father God, we just thank you for your word. We ask that your Holy Spirit would come and teach us, direct us into truth, help us to know what you want us to know, help us to feel what you want us to feel, and help us to grow closer to you and have a greater understanding of how to walk in this life. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so starting with Psalm 58. Uh, This is a psalm of David against the unrighteous uh, judges in the land, those who are supposed to be upholding righteousness but are actually doing just the opposite. I'm going to pick it up in verse 3. It says, The wicked go astray from the womb. Liars wander about from birth. They have venom like the venom of a snake, like the deaf cobra that stops up its ears, that does not listen to the sound of the charmers who skillfully weave spells. God, knock their teeth out of their mouths. Lord, tear out the young lion's fangs. May they vanish like water that flows by. May they aim their blunted arrows. And then skipping down to verse 10. The righteous one will rejoice when he sees the retribution. He will wash his feet in the blood of the wicked. Then people will say, yes, there is a reward for the righteous. There is a God who judges on earth. Psalm 109, the first 11 verses God of my praise, do not be silent. For wicked and deceitful mouths open against me. They speak against me with lying tongues. They surround me with hateful words and attack me without cause. In return for my love, they accuse me, but I continue to pray. They repay me evil for good and hatred for my love. Set a wicked person over him. Let an accuser stand at his right hand. When he is judged, let him be found guilty and let his prayers be counted as sin. Let his days be few. Let another take over his position. Let his children be fatherless and his wife a widow. Let his children wander as beggars, searching for food, far from their demolished homes. Let a creditor seize all he has. Let strangers plunder what he has worked for. So again, David praying against uh, someone who's continually mistreating him. Um, And then in Psalm 137, the last one, this is kind of a different context. This isn't David, but this is the people of Israel in the context of being destroyed by Babylon and exiled, uh, having their enemies come and take them captive, and they're in the land of Babylon, and they're being taunted by their enemies. Hey, sing us one of your songs from Jerusalem. Sing us one of Zion's songs, kind of making fun of them and picking up in verse 4. How can we sing the Lord's song on foreign soil? If I forget you, Jerusalem, may my right hand forget its skill. May my tongue stick to the roof of my mouth if I do not remember you, if I do not exalt Jerusalem as my greatest joy. Remember, Lord, what the Edomites said that day at Jerusalem. Destroy it, destroy it, down to its foundations. Daughter Babylon, doomed to destruction. Happy is the one who pays you back what you have done to us. Happy is he who takes your little ones and dashes them against the rocks. Yeah, pretty intense. So, is this supposed to be in our prayer book? something go wrong along the way? Uh, These are three of the more intense uh, imprecatory psalms. Um, But you'll find kind of bits and pieces of this in a number of other psalms, even like Psalm 139, where a lot of us are familiar with the the phrases of Psalm 139, like, uh, Lord, you knit me together in my mother's womb. I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your your works are wonderful. I know it full well. And, And all these familiar phrases of God's care for us. But then at the end, it's It goes, oh, that you would slay the wicked. Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? I hate them with perfect hatred. So you can see kind of a shift in Psalm 139. So so it's not limited to the three psalms I read from, but those are kind of the main ones. So how do we deal with these? What do we do with them? Uh, A lot of people have kind of struggled with this. They've, They've done a number of things. Some of them have said, these are just sinful, hateful cries that are just coming from the psalmist and we kind of understand where they're coming from but it's just wrong and you're not supposed to do this. And I don't think that uh, does justice to why they're in our, in our Bible. Uh, I don't think that's uh, a legitimate way to treat them. Other people think, yeah, they made sense in the Old Testament but they're, they're not for today. Um, the, the ethic in the New Testament is to love your enemies so while they had relevance back then, they don't any longer. Um, there's been other ways people have dealt with them. We'll, we'll get into that a little, but uh, 
First off, I just want to look at some of the surrounding context, what's going on in these psalms, um, kind of come to a more thorough understanding of what's happening before we decide, should we pray this way? What should we do? The first thing I think is really helpful to note is that these psalms aren't just the psalmist saying, I'm really angry and I want bad things to happen to this person and I'm going to think of bad things to happen to them and hope that that happens. That's kind of how we think of curses a lot, right? Like someone wants something bad to happen to someone else, so I'm going to curse them. I'm going to say I want this to happen and this to happen and this to happen and I hope it happens. That's not what's going on here. And the reason I say that is because the Psalms... If you look at them and if you compare them with other parts of Scripture, they're actually praying parts of the Scripture that came before them. They're praying from Exodus and Deuteronomy. They're praying what God said would happen to those who break the covenant or to those who oppress his people. Or they're carrying out the idea of the covenant with Abraham where God said, those who bless you I will bless or those who curse you I will curse. In other words, the psalmist isn't just saying, I'm going to come up, with, come up with bad things and hope it happens to you because I'm angry. But he's looking in his scriptures and saying, God, what you said would happen, let that happen. I need that to happen here. So for example, Exodus 22 reads like this. You must not mistreat any widow or fatherless child. If you do mistreat them, they will no doubt cry to me and I will certainly hear their cry. My anger will burn and I will kill you with the sword. Then your wives will be widows and your children fatherless. And that was very similar to what we saw in Psalm 109, where David prays, let his children be fatherless and his wife a widow. It's taking up even the same language. It's just saying, God, what you said would happen, let that happen. Um, and the one example is Psalm 137 with the very graphic ending, uh, with the judgment announced against Babylon. That's also already in the scriptures, the, that God was going to judge Babylon for how they had treated Israel during the exile. It says in Jeremiah 51, Therefore, look, the days are coming when I will punish Babylon's carved images. Her entire land will suffer shame and her slain will lie fallen within her. Heaven and earth and everything in them will shout for joy over Babylon because the destroyers from the north will come against her. This is the Lord's declaration. Babylon must fall because of the slain of Israel, even as the slain of the whole earth fell because of Babylon. So this, this judgment against Babylon has already been announced, and the psalmist is just picking up and saying, God, may that happen. And, and we also know that from the, from the law in the old Bible that God's perfect justice says an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. In other words, the justice should fit the crime perfectly. It shouldn't be more, it shouldn't be less. And so the, the psalmist there in 137 is saying, God, you saw what they did to us when they came and destroyed us. You saw what they did to our little ones. May it happen to them. We're helpless here, Lord. So first off, these psalms aren't just angry cries, but they're actually rooted in Scripture. Um, also, they're, they're coming from a place of weakness. They're coming from a place of weakness. The people who are praying these psalms aren't like the ones in charge. They aren't the ones who have power over others and saying, I just want my enemies to have a really bad time. No, they're coming from a place of weakness. They're from those who have been oppressed and mistreated. They're from those who have been persecuted. They're from those who have no other recourse. If God doesn't step in, they're done. If God doesn't step in, they're going to perish. And as they say often in the Psalms, Lord, if I perish, I can't praise you from the grave. If you don't step in, there's nothing I can do. They're stronger than me. Their armies are bigger than me. If you don't step in, we're done for. So these Psalms are coming from a place of weakness. They're not... They're not just anger against enemies, but they're people who are severely threatened with extreme injustice. And God is their only hope. Also, these psalms, just to note, they're leaving vengeance in the hands of God. And this is what uh, Miss Laura was saying, is that God's the defender here. The psalmists aren't saying, Lord, help me to slay the wicked. Or, Lord, I'm going to do this. Or, it's saying, Lord, May you do this. Let this happen to them. Oh, that this would happen to them. Oh, God, how long? When will this happen? In other words, it's calling on God to act. It's not the psalmist. It's not the believer's job to take personal vengeance. But it's calling upon the Lord to do it. And then just uh, finally, as far as principles about this, 
and how we can interpret them. You know, I, I mentioned that some people think that this made sense for the, for the old covenant, but in the new covenant where we're called to bless our enemies, to pray for them, is this still relevant? And I just want to point out that there are portions in the, in the New Testament that actually sound very like these, these imprecatory psalms. Um, now, having said that, there is, I would say, a shift, a slight shift of nuance in the New Testament where more, um, there's more of a focus on eternity. There's more of a focus both on blessings in the age to come and on judgments in the age to come. There's also more of a shift from, um, from the natural realm, realm to the spiritual realm now that God's people aren't a political nation. They're not, God's people aren't a country, Israel, in the New Testament, but they're scattered throughout the whole earth. So there's, there's some shifts in nuance in the New Testament. That said, this kind of language still finds, we still find it come up here and there in the New Testament. For example, in, in the first chapter of Galatians, where Paul's really concerned that the church of Galatia is buying into a different gospel that says you have to add some stuff to the perfect work of Jesus in order to be completely saved. And Paul's really concerned about that. He's so concerned about it that he says, if anyone comes to you preaching a gospel different than the one we preached to you, let him be accursed. Let him be cut off from God completely. Let, him not, let people like that not lead people astray from the kingdom of heaven. So there's similar, it's similar to, to the language of, of asking God's curse on those who are destroying his people in the Old Testament. Or in Acts 8 where, where the guy tried to buy the gift of giving the Holy Spirit from Peter. He said, give me money that I can lay my hand, or let, take this money so I can lay my hands on people and they also will receive the Holy Spirit. And, and Peter says, may your money perish with you. You thought you could buy the gift of God with money. And he, and he gives something like a, a statement of cursing there. But it's only if the, if the man doesn't repent of his wickedness. And then uh, just one last example from the New Testament is from Revelation 6. And here, uh, it's also very interesting because these are the cries of those who have been martyred for their faith. In other words, they're not sinful at this point. They're with the Lord. They, they can't pray in a sinful way anymore. Revelation 6, where it talks about the martyrs, and he says, when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slaughtered because of the word of God and the testimony they had given. They cried out with a loud voice, O oh Lord, holy and true, how long until you judge? Until you judge those who dwell on the earth? How long until you avenge our blood? And they're told to wait a little while until the, the full number of the martyrs is completed and they're given white robes. But here you see, God, they have slain us. How long until you respond? Are you just going to let this keep happening to your people? These are cries from those who have perfected, have been perfected in heaven. So this does carry on into the New Testament a bit. That said, what do we, what do, we do with it? Is this, should this be like our normal prayers? Is this, is this our go-to whenever we're wronged? Uh, I was really helped by one pastor and writer named John Day. He, he, he called this the extreme ethic of the believer. It's not the characteristic ethic. In other words, yes, we are called mainly to love our enemies, to bless them, to pray for them, love our neighbors. That's the main call for a Christian. That said, there are times, there are extreme times where people face extreme evil and justice that these psalms are appropriate. Now, you even see this in, in some of the psalms with David uh, in Psalm 109, Psalm 35, where even as he's asking God to avenge him with the wicked, he says earlier in the psalms, they, retreat, they repaid me evil for good. They repaid my love with hatred. In other words, David had been trying to love them. David had, he says at one point that he was fasting for his enemies when they were sick. So he had been loving, he had been praying for them. But there, there's a point where he's saying, they just keep responding with wickedness and justice. And this kind of reflects the heart of God in general. This reflects the heart of God in that he's patient, he's long-suffering, he's slow to anger, but there comes a time where he says, enough. There's a time where he says, no more. It's like the parable in Luke 13, 
where there's the fig tree, and the guy says, this has been three years, this fig tree hasn't given us any good fruit. Cut it down. And the guy says, wait, one more year, I'm going to care for it, I'm going to tend to it. Maybe it'll bear fruit, then if not after another year, then we can cut it down. God's patient. He wants to wait a little longer. He wants to be long-suffering, but there's a point where it's gone on too long. There's a point where the wickedness has become too pronounced. There's a point where the heart has become too hard, and he says enough. There are extreme circumstances. This isn't the characteristic ethic of a believer. This isn't if someone cuts you off while you're driving, you say, oh, may I wash my car in your blood. That's not, that's not how we should respond. That's not the response of the Christian or, or kids. If, if someone else is taking your screen time, you know, it's not, I'm not going to pronounce a curse on them because they're taking my screen time. That's not what I'm saying. Okay, this isn't how we, how we respond to normal situations. This is how Believers can respond to extreme situations. For example, the, the gruesome verse at the end of Psalm 137 talking about what happens to the little one because of what Babylon did to the little ones of Israel. Uh, I remember being in Rwanda many years ago and taking tours, seeing, learning about the genocide that happened in Rwanda, and we were in a church where they gathered people together and, and killed them all, and they, the lady giving the tour showed us a spot on the wall where what happened, being talked about in Psalm 137 with the little ones against the rock, showed us a spot on the wall where that happened. There are situations where these psalms make sense. And a lot of us haven't experienced these situations, so they seem really extreme. Um, but maybe some of you have faced serious wickedness and justice, maybe even repeatedly. And maybe you found language to help you in these psalms. Or maybe people who are being persecuted severely in other countries are finding language in these psalms that says, God is not blind to what's going on. There are extreme circumstances where these psalms make sense. How do we know? How do we know when to, when to pray this way or to pray blessing on our enemies? And, and I can't tell you that. That's just another one of those cases where we need God's Holy Spirit within us. There's many cases in the Christian life where we don't know, do I do it this way or this way? Like, for example, sharing the gospel. Like, it seems that God wants us to share the gospel with everyone. He wants everyone to be saved. He wants people to share with those who need it. But then it, the New Testament also says, don't, don't just cast your, your pearls before swine. Don't just give what's precious to those who are going to reject it and turn and hurt you. So there's, a, there's kind of a, when do, how do I know when to do which? And there's not, like, I can't give you, like, five points on when to do which. We need the Holy Spirit. And same here, where we, we have to trust God's leading in us to know how to pray, when, when to pray what. Um, so it's an extreme ethic. It's, it's not the normal. This, you shouldn't find yourself praying this way in normal day-to-day -day situations. But there may be situations where you find extremely comforting that God has put this in his prayer book. Hopefully you don't find those situations, but uh, God has promised persecution to his people. Uh, also, in, in praying this, I just want to say, it'd probably be good to acknowledge that God can answer these prayers in a couple ways and ask us, are we okay with that? And what I mean by that is, if you say, oh God, they're being wicked over and over. They're, they're killing your people or they're mistreating your people. Or, oh, slay the wicked. Well, God can kill the wicked a couple of ways. He can kill them by burying them with Christ and raising them up to new life with him and become a believer. And they change and they come to you and ask for forgiveness maybe. I mean, there's many examples of that happening. Are you okay with God answering the prayer that way? Are you okay with God taking the wicked and killing the old wicked person and bringing a new person out of them and embracing them as a brother, as many people in really hard situations have done. That might be one way that God kills the wicked, and another might be that he kills them the way we're thinking because he doesn't want to see this injustice continue any longer. Also, I think another point here is that this gives us, the point of this is to celebrate God's justice to celebrate God's justice. And we saw that in Psalm 58, the one we, we started with, where it says at the end, 
the people will say, yes, there is a reward for the righteous. There is a God who judges on earth. Celebrate that. That, the, that wickedness isn't just allowed to go without a king who oversees and says, I will act when I see fit. Wickedness is not going to rule at the end of the day. There is a God who acts. There is a God who will do justice. We can celebrate that. And these psalms are a reminder of that. Also, it's, it's a foretaste of the age to come. And a lot of times we talk about getting a foretaste of the age to come with blessings, right? We talk about God breaking in and healing someone so that we can see that in the age to come, people are going to be whole. God breaks in sometimes here and shows us what the age to come is going to be like by blessing people in a way that makes this age look more like it's going to be for eternity. Well, in the same way, God does that with judgments. It's a foretaste. God doesn't always judge in the here and now in the way we think or in the way the Psalms talk about. He doesn't always do it that way. But he does sometimes just to show us that in the age to come, perfect justice is going to be meted out. This is a foretaste of the age to come. And as image bearers of God, we love justice. We love it, right? Like when we watch movies and, and the bad guy gets what they want, there's something that says, yes, right? Like when, when they had just like, there, there had been an enemy and the good people had just like helped save their life because they're merciful and then the enemy turns and still is wicked to them. And you're like, seriously, he did that after they just saved him? I'm thinking like Toy Story 3 where, where this happened with the, with the bear, Right? And he, they just helped him, and then he turns his back on them, and then at the end when he's strapped to the front of that, that garbage truck, and you're like, yes! That's what he deserves. Right? We love justice. We're made in the image of God. He loves justice. But there's kind of a, kind of a tension in our hearts about loving justice because when, when we realize that we, if we get justice, it's, it's not good. We deserve God's curse. We deserve God's curse too. So there's a tension in loving justice. And the good news, the good news is even though we deserve curse, God says that everyone who doesn't keep all the words written in his law is under a curse. But the good news that follows that in Galatians 3 is that Jesus took upon himself the curse for us because it says, cursed is anyone who's hanged on a tree. He took that curse on himself so that we don't have to be conflicted about loving justice in the sense that, well, if I love justice, is it going to come upon me? Because Jesus took that justice upon himself. So that we can say, I don't have to be under a curse. Jesus came under a curse for me. And, and, if, and if you don't know that Jesus has come under a curse for you, if you don't know that Jesus bore your curse on that tree, I just invite you, come to him. Embrace him by faith. That way, you can know that the curse that you deserve isn't going to come on you. It came on someone else instead, God's perfect son, and that you can know that God's perfect justice will be carried out. It was carried out in the cross and it will be carried out forever and injustice will not go by without being dealt with. Finally, um, just kind of interestingly, it's not always a tension between do I love my enemy or do I ask for a curse on them. In fact, I think the teaching of the Bible is sometimes that by seeking God to judge your enemy, you're actually set free to love them. And that's what you see in Romans 12, where it says, don't pay back evil for evil, but leave room to the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And then right after that, it says, so if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink, for by so doing, you'll keep, keep burning coals on his head. In other words, if you entrust vengeance to God, you know you don't have to do it. And instead, you can love. So perhaps even praying these prayers can help you. No, this is in God's hand. He can deal with it. I can love this person. So I'm just going to invite the, uh, the worship team to come up for closing. But just as we close, just a reminder, God put this in our prayer book for a reason. Uh, even if it's uncomfortable, there may, there may be times Hopefully not, but maybe times in, in our lives where we will find this very appropriate and feel very comforted that God is a God of justice. There is a God who works justice on the earth. There is a God who will carry out justice. Either he will step in this age and in the situation where his people desperately need him, 
or he will act in the age to come. No wickedness will go unpunished ultimately, and we can rest assured in that. There is a just God who will carry out justice forever. Let's pray together. Father God, again, we just thank you for your word, and we ask that you come and teach us how to celebrate your justice and how to walk in love and mercy. Thank you so much that you are the perfect judge of the earth. Thank you so much that you took Jesus to bear the curse we deserve. Help us to love knowing that you will take care of justice now and forever. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand. Let's stand as we sing the last song. Shout your praise. 
Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. Great are you, Lord. One more time. All the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. Trust you, Lord. Come, Lord Jesus. Come, let your kingdom come. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done. trust ourselves into your hands. God, I thank you, just as Matt just said, that when we entrust justice, when we entrust vengeance to you, Lord, that it sets us free to love. So God, I ask that we would hold both intention, God, that we would cry out for justice, that we would long for your kingdom to come, your will to be done on earth. But God, in the tension, as we don't have the answers, that we would love well. God, that we would be so transformed and so entrusted into your hands that we would not have to seek our own vengeance, our own justice. So God, we ask that you transform our hearts right now. God, I pray for those right now in this room who are going through injustices, God, who have unresolved situations where there has not been reconciliation or where there maybe is still injustice being done, God. I pray that you would empower them right now by your Holy Spirit to walk as Jesus would have walked. God, we pray that our church would be an expression of who you are into this world. We ask that as we go from this place, we'd be filled with your spirit that we would be transformed into the image of Christ in love.